What is good? We're back. We got a full tripod, but one of our guys is a guest, but we got a good one for you today. I got my man Jay Wayne here mixing it up on the ones and twos. Fresh crack to get this one rolling, and we got D-Bro over there about to spit some hot fantasy fire for us. So how you doing, buddy? Doing good, guys. Um, it's it's about that time. I mean, I might pour whiskey sit here on the show. Um, I Look, I, thank y'all for having me, man. I mean, look, we just uh, we're kind of processing and I, I'm recouping from the NFL draft. Sure. So still kind of um, letting all this stuff marinate with these landing spots and all that kind of good stuff, man. But it's 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 a great time for Dynasty, guys. Uh, we got rookie drafts that are popping off and um the, the, it's so early that the ADP hasn't quite corrected, and there's some soft spots. So, I mean, I'm sure yeah. we're going to talk about a lot of things, man. But it's it's definitely a fun time to do some dynasty startups and drafts. Yeah. Do, do you do you I, like your you like your rookie draft now, or you like your rookie draft later? <laughs> oh, I like it immediately. Okay. Like uh, every one of them, we kind of push uh, for the Monday after the NFL draft. I've got two or three that we did before the NFL draft, which is a lot of fun. If you had the 101 like me and you took Malik Willis and you watch him <laughs> fall down the board and you're you're screaming internally the entire time, um, it's fun times, guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I almost interjected, but I want to let you roll. You said you said the word one of my favorite words, marinate. Uh, but mm-hmm. but the early rookie draft doesn't really let you marinate too much. You kind of have to like know what you want to do, and you know yep. a lot of times in this industry, everybody wants us to have all the answers right now you know i like i want to let it marinate man i want to let it breathe just yeah. like i would prefer my rookie draft to let it breathe just a, a, a lot little of bit, a lot of arrows up and down every day still i feel like you know for me oh, personally yeah. not you know yeah i mean there's some guys that um considering where they went in the draft that i bumped up ranks and sure. stuff and it's like you went away some things but then you don't want to overweigh it you know what i mean right. like like guys that like based off of um their profiles, their skill sets and things like that. Like you don't want to like you, you don't want to end up into like the CEH territory again where you're like, ah, he's the one oh one and then Right. right like right. that's that's the worst case scenario. Kinda like taking Malik Willis at the one oh one. Right. It's kinda right. bad. So before we get rolling, you know, subscribe, five stars, all the things that you do uh for your favorite stuff. Uh, but I wanna kick it to 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 Derek over there to uh let him uh push Whatever you would like on on the airwaves here. Yeah, man. I mean, everybody, uh, if you'd not follow me on Twitter, do so at Debro underscore FFB. Um, all my work is over at Fantasy Pros. So uh, I'll bounce between the two. The main show, um, which the Fantasy Pros Fantasy Football Podcast and the Dynasty Show. I was just on with uh, Pat Fitzmorris and Boggs the other day uh, doing a three round Dynasty rookie draft. I think we did uh, we did one QB. We didn't do Superflex. Um but yeah, we have our Dynasty Rookie Draft Kit uh, that is live. And when I say this, I don't want to sound like I'm used car salesman because I just that's just not me, man. Like if <clears throat> if it was not great, I wouldn't be pushing it live on a show. Um, but it's it's fantastic. And I like I've been playing Dynasty for a few years, deep in the weeds, too many damn leagues and stuff. But there's something in there for I think somebody with any flavor or any, where it doesn't matter where you're yeah, at in point. Dynasty, like. We have rankings, we have trade advice, we have startup strategy, uh, we have IDP profiles. Uh, Boggs wrote up, him and Joe, I think, wrote up. It was like over, th- there's 30 or 40 IDP profiles. I did most of the skill players. Like, I've, I wrote up about 30 players. I think we have 30 or 40 total in there. Um, so it's, it's just a mountain of stuff. And it doesn't matter whether you've been playing Dynasty, like you're doing your first startup right now. And you're dipping your toe into it, or you've been playing for a few years. I I legit think that there's something there for everybody. Nice. So definitely go check that out. And where can we find that again? Yeah, it's over at fantasypros.com. You click on the NFL uh, tab and drop down, and it's it's right there on the home page. Uh, if you just scroll over to the right. Yeah. All right. So definitely go check that out. And uh, I think we can segue into what we're going to get to today. We're going to talk a little draft capital, some landing spots, some super flex value. You guys did the one quarterback draft. We're not going to quite get to a draft here, but talk a little super flex value. And then we'll talk about some guys kind of at the end of the first round, whether you're into it or not. seems like there's a lot of variation uh, throughout there. You're kind of just picking your flavor um, and, and 
seems like it's kind of all over the place. So we'll kind of end with that. So let's get it started. You kind of alluded to it a little bit right right before we uh, uh, had a little intro there. But let's talk a little draft capital and landing spot. Like how much does it matter to you? How do you apply it? And then sort of how long does it last if, if, if you kind of understand what I'm putting down there? So, I mean, it, it really comes down to um, it, it, it depends twofold. Like what positions are you talking about? Um, some of the team makeup. Yeah, you can craft narratives around that. That's why everybody loves Tyler Algier, although he went in the fifth round. Um, so there's a lot of different ways you can approach it. I mean, if you're just going based off of hit rates and stuff like that outside of the top three rounds of the draft for running backs, your hit rates get really low when you're talking about the fourth and fifth round guys. Um, fourth round guys can pan out. So some of that and with this running back class, we saw a lot of guys fall into the fourth round, some in some really good landing spots. I'm sure we're going to talk about here, but a lot of this comes down to some of its positional and some of it. I look at like just basically thresholds. Mm -hmm. So for quarterbacks, you get outside of the top two rounds and you're looking at some really scary propositions for these guys to ever pan out. So, so is, basically, is, go ahead. Do you have like ahead. a percentage of that? What, what is it like a specific percentage of players that aren't going to hit if they were outside of the first two rounds? It gets really low. I mean, I, I've got um, a few resources that I've looked at previously. I could rattle off the numbers off the top of my head. Um, but as far as uh, just looking at the benchmarks and stuff, like, I mean, put, put it this way. For quarterbacks, just in general, if you were to look around the league and you look at all the starting quarterbacks for all 32 teams right now, almost every one of those guys was drafted in the first round, period. Outside of like maybe a few outliers, like you're talking about Russell Wilson, you talk about Dak Prescott, mm -hmm. um, nobody Tom. else, nobody else is Tom Brady, so we can just <laughs> punt that shit. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And nobody else is going to be Tom Brady, so we can just punt that shit. Like a lot of Kirk basically cousins, though. doesn't matter, you know, and, and our cousins, you know, and but legit, we just talked about like that's one hand yeah, yeah. of the number of quarterbacks that are drafted outside of the top two rounds that have starting jobs and have held them for a number of years. Sure. So you look at just that in a, in a, from a bird's eye view, and even the guys that pan out that are after the first round in general, the way that I'll look at the quarterbacks is if you're not getting drafted in the first round or maybe second round, the all the things that you need to go right to end up being one of these guys that's drafted in the third or fourth round that pans out and is a multi-year fantasy player. Hell is good for our purposes. Mm -hmm. You really have to have like two things. One, yes, you have to play good. That's uh, that's obvious. I know I'm not breaking any ground by saying that. But the number two on that is you have to have a stable head coaching situation. Right. Like you look at Russell Wilson, stable head coach the entire time, never changed. Bill Belichick in New England, stable head coach the entire time, never changed. Dak Prescott, same thing. A lot of these other Kirk Cousins got time to, with the same head coach to sit here and establish himself. You know, so, and, and I say all this to mean that, like, it's not just looking at hit rates. It's looking at, like, yes, guys can come out of the woodwork and they can be outliers. Mm -hmm. But if you're making that bet consistently in Dynasty year sure. after year after year after year and you're making these outlier bets, the math says you're going to lose more than you win. So that's not really a way I want to approach it. Like, yeah. sure, if if I can take a guy that's, you know, say a quarterback that I like a lot and the last pick or I pick him off of a waivers, that's fine. But am I going to invest like a second round, like super flex pick in a rookie draft for a quarterback that's drafted in the third or fourth round? Shit, no, I'm not doing that. Like, I'm not going to sit here and draft Sam Howell, who went in the freaking fifth round in the, the top two rounds of a rookie draft. There's no way in hell I'm doing that. Right. I would agree with Sam Howell for sure, dropping to the fifth. But, you know, Ritter and, and Willis there in the third, I'm willing to have a discussion in the second round, which we're going to get that to that in, in a little bit with these quarterbacks specifically um and you know i would wonder what 
what the hit rate of first round quarterbacks even is. You know, it can't be much better than a coin flip. Um, so you know, I get I get not banking on finding an outlier every single time, but it also isn't going to scare me from trying to find an outlier here and there. You know, you don't have to. Obviously, you don't have to force the issue. You don't have to take Malik Willis anymore in the first round of a startup. <laughs> one, right? one, you don't take him one one anymore. You don't. You're definitely not taking a one one. You know, maybe he gets, maybe he makes it into the end of the first, and and there's a ton of talent there. And if you wanted to do that, that that'd be fine. But um, but at some point you wanted to take him one one, and it's not the like in his specific situation. You know, is it is it really the worst gamble for for what the ceiling could be to to go? I mean, we to go second round with with Malik Willis mid second, let's say. I mean. <laughs> The bucket that you're in, it depends on where you're at in the second round uh, for me. Now, if you're looking at the top 24, like where I'm based off of, and I've got my ranks pulled up right now, if you were just to look at the top 24 players that I have ranked, like you're falling into the the first part of the second round into a bucket of second and third round wide receivers, third round running backs, you know, so... Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of different guys, like, I'm I'm not taking... The only quarterback I would take in a Superflex rookie draft in the first round is Kenny Pickett, period. Mm -hmm. I'm not taking Malik Willis. I'm not taking yep. any of these other guys Agreed. in the third round. I'm not even going to take them in the beginning of the second round. You know, when you have guys like George Pickens, Alec Pierce, second round wide receivers that have legitimate easy paths to volume. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if you want to parse through, like, okay, taking one of the quarterbacks versus a, a third or fourth round running back. That That's fine. I understand that. But the other side of this is, can we craft a narrative where these quarterbacks can play? Yeah, you, you, you surely can. But the other side of that is these teams didn't invest the draft capital. That's going to get, give them one multiple chances. Um, they could, if they go out there and they play five, six games this season. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they suck. There's no thing. There's nothing set in stone because the team didn't invest hardly anything in these players to give right. them a second shot. Yeah. You know, so if Malik Wills is pushed into starting sometime this year and he's terrible, that legit might be all we ever see out of Malik Willis in the NFL, period. Yep, for sure. You know, because the NFL just told us they're not high on this quarterback class. All these guys dr dropped the third round. So now you take what the NFL has told us for these quarterbacks, and if they bomb their opportunity in the first go around, can we say that the NFL just said that they were not high on them? They played like shit the first time that they got a chance. Are they going to get a second chance? Like yeah. that, that that's not necessarily going to no, happen. Not. Whereas like, you get first round quarterbacks that get second and third chances. I mean, shit, look at Sam Darnold, right? He's a first round quarterback. Well, he sucks. I, I guess part but of he's still getting chances. <laughs> I guess part of the question then for, for, you know, draft capital is like, so this year, the NFL, maybe they just, instead of trying to jam a round pig into a, a square hole here, maybe you finally were like, Hey, we're not just going to make Sam Darnold and, and, Dwayne Haskins and Daniel Jones and we're not going to make all these guys first round quarterbacks because of necessity. Maybe we got it took a little while to say, hey, we're a passing league. We're not going to draft a wide receiver in the first round. Hey, we're just not going to jam these guys into there. Like, I just feel like case by case, like Tennessee's situation um, is potentially a little different there. They shipped out a wide receiver that maybe they don't want to pay. Maybe they don't want to pay Tannehill for as much as they want to pay him. You get an, a pretty risk-free go round with Malik Willis here. I mean, they'll come out and, and they could, you could, you could do a little Jalen hurts back half of the season where they ran a lot, which they, they're going to do anyway. Like the Tennessee Titans, I feel like is a perfect situation to land in there to be like, to make me feel okay with taking a chance on Malik Willis in the second round with just what the upside could be. I mean, Trey Lance got in for a couple games and it didn't do anything to be like, oh yeah, let's boost his stock. He looks fucking awesome. But he's still like a second round startup pick in Superflex because of where he is. I mean, I get it that he was a first round pick. So I like, I understand he's all a first those round percentages. Pick, though. I right, mean right. I understand that. But I mean, the, the Tennessee Titans will figure it out in practice, whether or not Malik, if he gets in and shits it up in the first game, but he's pretty decent in practice. That's, you know, it's a lot for your first game for a guy who was, and, and second of all, like which one of these quarterbacks wasn't going to sit. That's pretty much was the narrative on just about any of these guys. Um, with the exception of maybe Kenny Pickett was the guy who could start right away. 
Um, so, I mean, I'm not, I agree with you for the most part, but like, I think case by case, like for just a guy like with Malik Willis with the legs and the howitzer of an arm that he has, like, I feel like it's, I feel okay taking a shot with him kind of middle of the, of the second round there. Um, any, I mean, I, I get it, but it's it's looking at it also through Rosalar glasses. Like we can craft narratives sure. for Malik Willis. Like okay, like yeah, could they move on from Tannehill and he and say cut him and save eighteen million next year? Yep, that could happen. The other thing that can happen, like say Malik Willis gets a chance or he plays this year, he doesn't play well. Right. He's a third a round draft. pick. Right. Yeah. Like if Tennessee bombs this year, like say Tannehill gets hurt, Malik gets thrusted into the role. Mm-hmm. He plays terribly. They end up with a top 10 pick, top 15 pick, what have you. Who's to say like right now in preliminary mocks, looking at the early, early mocks, looking at 2023, sure. they're mocking six, like six quarterbacks, quarterbacks in the right. first round. Yeah. Like, so who's to say that like we're playing all these scenarios out the other side of that is Tennessee just says we're going to go draft a quarterback in the first round, sure. and Malik Wills is dead. Right, you know. So as much as like, but I'm, we can middle craft the upside scenarios. The, the, for the upside, the, isn't that what you're I doing mean, in the middle of the second round? Aren't you drafting for upside at that point? Yeah, but I mean, tell me in the second round, you've got second round wide receivers that have upside too. Like Alec yeah. Pierce tested out the damn gym. He did. He, he got did, second round draft capital. That's also sort of on a projection a little bit too. And now I get it. Like Alec Pierce, nobody was really super excited well, about. I mean, Alec that's Pierce. every prospect. But you like projecting. six three, you like six three four four, and going to the Colts. So I get it. I mean, yeah. I understand that. Um, and and I wouldn't necessarily like. Maybe Alec Pierce would be the last guy that I would take. Malik Will. There is definitely a line of demarcation for me of some of those second uh, second round wide receivers. But it comes to a point where it's like, what what. What third round running back are you, are you taking the Niners running back over Malik Willis that they drafted? No, I mean, I think that like when you get past the second round wide receivers, probably um, and some of this comes down to, uh, again, like your roster. And it, it, I mean, it, I have no problem with anybody taking the upside shot. Like I love Malik Willis. Mm-hmm. I think that the upside is definitely real for him. You know, so we're talking about specifically Malik Willis. Yeah, if you you get past a lot of these wide receivers and stuff like that, I have no problems taking the shot on him. Now, there's no way in absolute hell I'm going to draft Matt Corral in the second round. I'm not doing that. No, I'm, I, and I'm I sure as hell not going to touch Desmond Ritter. Like, we can have that conversation too. Yeah. And all of those guys went in the same round. But if you look at their skill sets and how they play and things like that, like I do not foresee a massive, massive upside for Matt Corral, nor do I see that for Desmond Ritter. I, Fine with I just that. don't. Fine. I'm, so I, I agree yeah. with you. It's it's basically just for me that Willis was a guy that was being considered one, two. The NFL told you something a little different, but I, maybe it was more predicated on, hey, like I said, we're not going to jam these round holes into square however a square peg into a round hole here for a guy who isn't ready which almost none of those guys were necessarily yeah. ready um besides maybe Pickett, which is maybe what did make them jam that hole uh kind of right in there say hey we got a guy who could be ready and they were like hey we're just not gonna we can't put first round capital into a guy who's who we want to sit a la trey lance now you know they had a different little bit different situation well i guess it's really not all that different from tennessee's um, but you get to see, took a shot in the third round. You get to see what he could do. You, maybe you could save some money. And Tennessee is just an organization that, at this point, I feel like you got to trust them a little bit. They, they've they've been pretty good at, at figuring we? out how to win games. Like, I mean, yeah. But besides that, like, I mean, they drafted. Kit, they took the the risk on Caleb Farley last year. They they dra- they traded a second round pick for Julio Jones. Didn't do anything. Right, no, I mean, that- they just traded a. They traded for Robert Woods, who all of his metrics scream that he's on the downside of his career, and he's coming off an ACL. Sure. I I think Tennessee personally, and I, look, I think Tennessee is a team that's been living off of smoke and mirrors for the last few seasons. 
Um, if you look at their defensive metrics, like, yeah, they were really good last year. But the few previous seasons before that, it, it was a lot of smoke and mirrors. Um, and, and a lot of, I honestly think Arthur Smith did a lot there, too. Sure. Like, I, I fully believe well, that. Like, Todd first... Downing is not a good offensive coordinator. Right. There's also the first year of a, of a new coordinator. So you're, you're, you're trying to figure some things out. And they, like, you got to give them credit. They, they, they were playing without with a rickety A.J. Brown missing time. Julio Jones didn't play. Derrick Henry yeah. missed a lot. And they, they were the number one seed. So, like, they just figure out a way to muddy it up and win games. Like, I can't I can't knock you for that. Like, everybody has bad draft picks. Um, but, I mean, I, I trust them from a wins-loss standpoint at this point anyway of figuring it out. Like, I, I think they got a good head coach um, and a decent GM. Uh, yeah, so. I mean, I, I believe in their I believe in their head coach and their GM and stuff more than I believe in their their offensive coordinator and such. Um, so so, dra- know, so let's, let's get back a little bit to draft capital. So you said it might vet, like so where's the that line where you're you're done touching guys for running backs and and uh, wide receivers like in the second round of a rookie draft or, or you know, just give me your your kind of take on non quarterbacks. Um, I mean, really, with wide receivers. A lot of it depends on where they're. I mean, this really comes down to like ADP and stuff. You know, we have a, sec, a slew of second round wide receivers that are dropping in drafts right now because, you know, maybe their their analytical profile isn't pretty. We don't like the landing spot. Like the fact that you can get a lot of these second round wide receivers that are falling to some to some of them to the very back end of the second round. Hell, maybe you get John Mechie or Wando Robinson in the third. Yeah. I mean, I had an industry draft this week where I took Rondell Robin, Wondell Robinson in the middle of the third. And it's like, there are parts of his analytical profile that are pretty damn good. Like his college dominator is good. His breakout age is good. He's small, but he's going to play the slot. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't know where Kadarius Tony or what's going to happen to him. Sterling Shepard's coming off an Achilles. So right. I think that if you look at the different positions, if I'm just going to bird's eye view this. Wide receivers, a lot of the guys, obviously, we all love the first round guys. The second round guys, yes. Once you get into the third and fourth round guys, you're really, you're drafting guys off of not so much draft capital, but you're drafting them off of traits. You're drafting them off of profiles and things like that. Because the third and fourth round wide receivers or anything after that, that's really what you're targeting. Um, Even over landing spot. Um, in in some different fashions because wide receivers targets are earned you have to have talent to earn targets if you're not any good it doesn't matter the draft capital you could just still suck you know like right we've seen second round guys that have flamed out like a la denzel mims and a bunch of other dudes right um running backs it comes down to a lot of that is draft capital you know so your top three rounds that's where you're looking at your best hit rates um it gets really sketchy when you get to round four and even later than that uh, we do have some, you know, UDFA guys and people that have come out of the woodwork and stuff. I think that right now we're looking at in some rookie drafts where there's there's a good bit of recency bias. Um, and this comes to a few different teams and also some different situations like the recency bias around draft capital when it's pertaining to two different players like Tyron Davis Price and Tyler Algier, they're they're going like Algier in a lot of drafts and ADP is going ahead of Tyron Davis Price. Mm-hmm. And that should not be at all. Like at all. He should not Tyler Algier should not be going ahead of him. There's no and way a lot he of that, be better than Tyler Davis Price, is what you're saying. No, or, I'm not saying that. What I'm it. saying is well I will take Tyron Davis Price over Tyler Algier ten times out of ten. Period. Because of the and a lot of that, draft capital. Well, because he went in the third round, guys. Like, Tyler Algier, everybody's gravitating to him because he landed in Atlanta. And we've been pining for somebody to go to Atlanta sure. for years. So now it's like, oh, there's a running back that went to Atlanta. And it's like, okay, everybody's crafting all this. Like, oh, he's going to get playing time. He's going to win that job out of camp. It's like. Damian Williams didn't look like he was totally dead when he played before he got hurt with the Bears last year. Cordell Patterson had the same yards after contact per attempt. He was immediately behind guys like Najee Harris, Miles Sanders and stuff. So even though he's 31, he's not dead either. So, I mean, he and they were playing him as a legitimate running back down the stretch last year. 
There's a world where Tower Algier doesn't even see the freaking field, or he plays a minimal role, and they just committee the hell out of this. What, what was your stance Whereas, on Algier pre-draft? I wasn't a huge fan. I mean, the, the thing with Algier is his numbers are really, really good, mm -hmm. except when you turn on the film, he doesn't play like that at all. He, he plays like he tested. He doesn't break tackles extremely well. Like, yes, his numbers are great, but a lot of this, he's breaking arm tackles and stuff. He's caught from behind religiously. And if you look at his burst, especially on outside zone runs, like they're going to have to like probably Arthur Smith has, has run a lot of his own concepts and stuff. He did that in Atlanta, um, at least to the beginning of the season. He did that a ton in Tennessee. Um, I don't see them doing that with Algier. He's kind of like, a half zone, half gap kind of guy. And if they want to get him downhill, they're probably going to have to do that in the NFL because he's going to get caught from behind a ton. Um, so, I mean, I, I, so you're, you're, he, you're, are you saying you're not super concerned with landing spot really very much? That, how, that, how much does that weigh into any of these decisions? Cause it would, it would seem on the surface that the landing spot in Atlanta is maybe a little softer for him to, to come to valuable, meaningly, meaningful snaps, maybe quicker than uh, Davis Price potentially could. Um, and I, I'm not saying I agree or disagree with you. I, I, re I don't really like, I didn't like Algier coming in, and I definitely would not take him in the middle of the second round for me personally. Um, yeah, right. I would. I mean, when it comes too. down to, I like, my whole thing about it is, is that like, the draft capital tells you something and, and we have to deal with recency bias, you know, like one, we've been wanting a running back to land in Atlanta for the last two seasons Two, everybody was paying up first round picks for Trey Sermon last year, who's a third round running back. And you mm -hmm. see the easy parallels there and they all got burned. And so everybody's putting that on Tyron Davis price right now and saying, well, yeah, but Trey Sermon was a flop. Um, and Elijah but Mitchell that fifth round Elijah Mitchell though, and, and and fifth round Elijah Mitchell came out of nowhere and he played really really well. But also you know? there was no incumbent in in San exactly. But now Raheem there, Mostert now got is. hurt, right? So he was he was a, out of the a picture, guy with, and probably with only one year left on the contract, a guy who habitually does get hurt. Uh, it was it was an easy target where Atlanta kind of has the easy target and there's an incumbent in San Francisco. So maybe slightly different than the sermon scenario, I guess. It's different, too, because I will hands down say that Elijah Mitchell is a better running back than Tyler Algier. He has more raw talent. He has better speed. He's te he tested better. Um, I, I just think he's a better running back. But the other thing about it is like but people are pushing Tyron Davis Price into the third hell the late third round and they're taking Tyler Algier over him and I just think it's wrong man like San Francisco is telling you that they're not happy with their running back room that's what they went out and drafted a third round running back they they're not happy to, with what they have they need more guys well, so, I think they're uh, happy you just can't necessarily trust are they telling Mitchell. are they telling you that with the third round receiver that they took too I mean essentially I mean some of that could be Debo insurance some of that can be you know, they want a guy to sit here and do some of the Debo things uh, as far as playing the wide back and let Debo just play the wide receiver role. Yeah. You know, I think that that was an insurance pick. I don't think it was a good insurance pick Yeah. Um, because Danny Gray, outside of being fast, it's like Danny Gray and Vilas Jones, outside of being fast, their analytical profiles are terrible. Yeah. So I, I don't think it was a good pick. But as far as San Francisco goes, like. Yeah, I mean, I think they're telling you that they're not happy with the running back room. Like, they, st they, because look, Jeff Wilson is still there. Jeff Wilson has played well for them when he's been called upon. Well, you have Trey Sermon, either. who, that's fair, last year, but he was coming off of injury. You look at the two seasons prior to that, and he played yeah, perfectly. I was fine. big into Jeff Wilson, but he just, he didn't, he didn't look great on the field. No, I mean, well, again, some of that was he was coming off an injury, but. San Francisco's well, offensive line was playing like dog shit as, at the beginning of the year. As soon as a, as soon as you walk into the running back room for the 49ers, you have some sort of injury, and you, you're <laughs> just going to be dealing with it all year long. You're going to come in and out of games, and I don't know what kind of juju they got bad over there, but it's like them boys are definitely going to get hurt. And they like they like a they like to run the ball a lot, and B mm -hmm. Shanahan and all his disciples like stables they like fresh bodies they like to rotate they like committees they don't like paying a guy very much so they take a bunch of stabs in rookie drafts because it's you know we're almost seeing that with with rookies now with wide receivers because they don't want to pay the wide receivers what you have to pay them you saw ag brown get traded but anyway um i, I don't know where i mean just to put all, a bow on this guys can we can we definitively say right now sitting here 
that there is no range of outcomes or a world that we can't live in where Tyron Davis price is the lead back walking into this year. Can we definitively say that with San Francisco? I mean, if, if Mitchell's healthy, then I, yeah, I can pretty much definitively say that now if he's, if these knees that are getting scoped at the end of the season and he's not quite right, then, then no. But I mean, Elijah Mitchell looked fantastic and they didn't, you didn't even see the pass catching role. I think the Niners are about to come in here and run the dog shit out of the football with Trey Lance coming in and starting the first couple games. And they always wanted a committee. And for some reason, Trey Sermon is, you know, you saw Ayuk get doghoused. Trey Sermon got doghoused. And I don't know, that motherfucker might get cut before the <laughs> before we get into the season it at might. this point. Um, I but mean, yeah, Shanahan I think does I all kinds of weird say shit. say that Mitchell's going to be the starter. It, it, mm. You know, if health isn't an issue, why wouldn't he be? I mean... Tell me why it would be. I mean, because he was we good. Because he crushed. He was fantastic okay. on the field, no? And then they spent a third round pick on Trey Sermon and he buried him. I mean, we've seen multiple. Dante Pettis crushed down the stretch that year and then he got shoved in the doghouse. Brandon Ayuk played fantastic yeah, yeah. when everybody was hurt and he got shoved in the doghouse. So you're telling me that like the same thing couldn't happen to Elijah I'm, Mitchell? I mean, I'm, I'm saying that it, it certainly could happen, but I mean, if. if, if I'm a Niners fan, so I, I watched a ton of Niners. Like there, there's, they like that guy. They liked him ever since he got there. He was, they were saying that he was beating Trey Sermon out consistently, and he's high effort, high motor, looked great out on the field, was big in, in spots, and was was nicked up through his through his rookie season. And I don't, you didn't even see the pass catching ability, which I think is probably a, you know a decent part of his game that you didn't even see last year. I think well, they just not stable. See What's that? We might we might not see it. I yeah. mean, they don't they religiously don't throw to their running backs a ton, so I don't I don't know if we do see it. Especially if Lance is in there. I mean, a lot of your mobile quarterbacks are not going to check down. They're just going to take the take off and run for five yards. At the end of the day, I, I I mostly agree with you that I had I don't have any problem taking Ty Davis Price over Algier, and I I like the situation. Mm -hmm. I know that if he gets in the game, like my whole thing is is I want to take the cheapest 49ers running back. That's who I want. Probably not Trey Sermon mm -hmm. if he's the cheapest because. We, we don't really know what the hell's going on over there, but that, that's oh, that's yeah. why I have a bunch of Elijah Mitchell on my team because there was no way that I was taking Trey Sermon in the first round, and you could get you Elijah, could get Elijah Mitchell, Mitchell all day in the third for cheap. And if you're going to push yeah. Ty Davis Price down to the third round, then I'll trade up to try to get a little piece of that because why not? Yeah, like, that is a good landing spot technically, even though there is an incumbent who did pretty well. But you know, you're not wrong by saying, you know, why couldn't uh, Mitchell be fucking up and you know, Ty Davis gets that job and grabs a hold of it. But yeah, I mean, look, I, I just think there's a range of outcomes and we get into dynasty rookie drafts and in the, and the, the dynasty community in general, there's a lot of situations that, that get dealt with or at least approached at like, and a lot of this is like echo chamber bullshit, like where people are like, this is what's gonna happen. It's certain it's gonna happen. Right. And then it's like, we can't really say that, you know, right. like, so I like to deal in a lot of these situations and range of outcomes. It's like, there's a lot of different stuff where like, where we get it wrong. We get the situation wrong. Hell, sometimes we get the profile wrong. You know, there's right. guys that walk into the, to the NFL where we're like, Oh, he's going to suck. He's terrible. Blah, blah, blah. Like at one point last year, fellas, like, and this just shows you that like anything can happen and we could talk ourselves. Certain people could talk themselves into all kinds of crazy shit. There was a time last year. I'm old enough to remember when people were talking about Jamar Chase can't catch a damn football mm -hmm. like that shit happened. And uh, who, who was who was the guy in Minnesota that was out playing uh, Jefferson when he was a rookie? What, what was his name? I can't even remember his name. Um but, you know, he was he was out snapping him for once, you know, out playing him every time he was on the field. So, yeah, no, I, I agree. Yeah. So, I mean, I like to approach a lot of these situations like range of outcomes. And and sometimes if the capital says like, OK, the team likes the guy, they drafted somebody in the third round. It's like, all right, well, I'll take shots on him over a fifth round running back and saying, like, look, there's a range of outcomes where he could be the starter. And if that's the case, then it's a massive equity grab. You know, like you get him at the top of the third round, you trade up, you get him at the back end of the second round. He he comes out of the gate and he's the starting running back and he crushes the first two, three games. Flip him. You could flip him for a first, maybe mm -hmm. a late first. You know, I mean, that's possible. So it's just trying to target some of these situations where maybe the ADP is off. Or if we're wrong on the evaluation of this players, then 
you know, you can gain some equity there in Dynasty. Yeah, I mean, I think I think for me, the way I, I don't really dislike, there, there's not too many players in most rookie drafts where I'm like, I fucking hate that guy. There's, he's trash. There's no way he's going to be on my team. What dictates it is, like you've said a couple of times, is, is ADP, either rookie mm-hmm. or startup. That's what's going to dictate who I take where and, and where I make my trades. Mm-hmm. And like you said, to start it off, there's some soft spots here and there that, you know, I want to get into that spot because I like three guys right in that range and I'm, I'm fine with kind of any one of them and if i can trade back because i just happen to be in that range one or two spots and, and stay in that spot that, that that's kind of the way i'm i'm continuously gonna play this game so you know i i, yep. I guess i mostly agree with the sentiments of what you're saying I, I i also like you know i like the range of outcomes mentality because a lot of times people use draft capital as an absolute you know and it's just oh like, absolutely and 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 it doesn't take a lot of time to research and find where you know i mean i was probably taking elijah mitchell over tutu atwell last year in drafts in rookie drafts right that's a fifth round running back that i liked pre-draft i liked the player before he got drafted and then i loved the landing spot because i like the coach and the scheme and the offense Draft capital wasn't great. Tutu out was a second round pick, but you know I wasn't about to take that guy that I didn't like, Tutu out will, over the guy that I did like, just yep. because of the draft capital. Now I'm not saying that you shouldn't adjust accordingly. Like, you know, yep. no one's gonna say take Malik Willis one two anymore because of the draft yep. capital. And the NFL told us that he's not worth. Nobody's it. nobody's taking Spiller yeah. as a top three back. Right. In we the really first like, round anymore. We really like Spiller pre draft. We probably had him at like. In the one three to one six range, not going to do that now. Not going to tell people to do that now, right? You can let him fall to somewhere in the second round, and uh, and some people are just out altogether. I'm still down to take shots on Spiller over guys that got yeah, drafted I'm, I'm ahead of him. Out. You know, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm down, down to draft him over guys that, that went ahead of him. You know, I'm not going to let yep. Spiller or Ty Davis Price. Oh, um, actually, it, the funny thing is, I have them ranked immediately back to back in my rankings. Yeah. And I have Spiller over him. Yeah, for me, um, that's a no-brainer. I'll take Spiller all day long. Yeah, and, and, and a lot of this, and this, we need we need to go back to this. A lot of this, and I'm not saying that, like we're talking about, and y'all, y'all have already mentioned it. I'm not saying that draft capital is the Bible that you need yeah. to go by. But you need to like there's there's so many things that we factor in when we look at these prospects. It's like we nobody wanted to take Tutu Atwell. It wasn't the draft capital that that threw us off about Tutu Atwell. It's not the fast that fact that Tutu Atwell was fast as shit. It right. came down to the fact that if Tutu Atwell ever becomes a thing in the NFL, he's gonna be the outlier of all outliers because he's just the size of a damn seventh grader. Right. And that that's what it really comes down to. So that's like nobody wanted to draft Tutu Atwell, not because of the landing spot, not because of the draft capital. It it comes down to that, like, there's not a lot of other guys that have ever hit in the NFL that have been his size, the even BMI. if they're fast as lightning. Yeah, right. You know, so, you know, yeah. what, and, as, and I guess that's part of like the conversation today is how much does the draft capital weigh into the model? You know, is BMI more important than draft capital? It's just and it's almost like it's just confirmation bias is recency. What did what? That's all I ever want to do, and I'll, I'll be honest. I'm going to use whatever argument supports my opinion, you know? Like, I'll just <laughs> say whatever. I'll find one fact that supports my opinion and use it, and I'll be honest about it. You know, I'll be like, I, you know, because if you like a guy, then he's one injury or two injury aw- injuries away from being the starter. If you don't like a guy, well, then it's muddy in that room, and there's a <laughs> yeah. lot of guys in yeah. front of him. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I mean, no, I mean, and yeah. that's that's kind of what it comes down to, like what we're talking about. Like, I think I think Ty Davis Price and Isaiah Spiller is a perfect example. You have one guy that went in the third round. There's a lot of different guys in the backfield. You got another guy that went in the fourth round, and it's like, oh, Austin Eckler just crushed stuff. Yeah, but the other part of not only just looking at the talent profile, the analytical profile, the draft capital, um, the landing spot. The other thing that I like to weigh in all of these different things is is contract situations. Mm-hmm. You know, right. so. And when they're going in the land deal, he could hold out. He could be cut. I mean, he could be cut as soon as next year. I think 1.5 million dead is what they owe him. Yeah. And then it falls off. And plus he's going into this age 27 season. Right. You know, like so you just said, he's so cheap right now. Like he should hold out because right, he has no fucking awesome. This is his last chance to get paid. Like there could be yep. a real Eckler holdout here. And, there could and we be like the Spiller, other side so I'm creating the fucking narrative. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I like the landing spot, and the reason I got him over Ty Davis Price is because the Chargers have tried to incorporate another running back in this backfield mm-hmm. 
for multiple years. And the only reason they haven't done it, and they lean so hard on Eckler, who's been dinged up um, yep. the last two two seasons. It's happened. Yeah, He's been dinged up, and they've leaned so hard on him because they didn't have anybody else that, that wasn't dog shit. Joshua Kelly, is I, I liked him coming out. He played terribly. Mm-hmm. Larry Roundtree was not that guy. No. Justin Jackson can't stay freaking healthy to save his life. You know, right. so they were like, look, we want a running mate. And, you know, we, we toss a little bit of common sense sauce into this mix here is that this is a team that has Super Bowl aspirations. Do yeah. they want to run Eckler into the ground throughout the season or do they want him fresh and he's going to sit here and be there when they need him in the playoffs and to push for a Super Bowl run? Right. Well, of course. Right. Shit, yes, they want him. Yeah. You know, so they're going to use Isaiah Spiller and you look at Eckler's contract. You know, you can craft narratives where, okay, Spiller went in the fourth round, but he has a, a, a definitive role from week one. Yes, they drafted Spiller in the fourth round, but what if Eckler's contract? They decide to move on from him. Mm-hmm. You know, Spiller, he gets hurt, whatever. You know, there's a lot of different ways to, to splice this up, but I think it's a really good uh, talking point, especially with those two running backs. Yeah, I agree. So, I mean, to, to kind of get off the draft capital thing a little bit, I, you know, <laughs> I, I think it's I think it is I think it's a huge blanket statement that you hear just ad nauseum before the draft like oh well, what's the capital going to be and like I'll be honest like I didn't even look into Ty Davis price really because I didn't either I, I'm gonna I didn't let, either I, I've been doing this for long enough that like at some point I'm going to get to the all the guys who are you know pretty consensus as the guys and then I'm going to probably let the NFL dictate that and then I'll get to watching tape on all these guys and figuring out now if you have a rookie draft right away not super conducive to that attitude uh, but it also saves me time from having to you know get really caught up on uh you know you know maybe the dude from Baylor who got drafted in the sixth round by the Bears like you know yeah. I didn't have to get I never got caught up on him because you I didn't watch him, time because, watching him so yeah. um and I got, if I had endless time I'd watch all these fucking right, guys for but, sure I mean but I, I feel well, like the other just, thing about it is you do have surprises like that. Like, right. I didn't see Ty Davis price going that high. Oh. Now, the, the funny thing is, is that I, as I was prepping for our draft show over at fantasy pros and I'm going through all these different teams and top 30 visits and how many, how many teams and, and teams that you had the giants that met with a lot of running backs, the commanders met with a lot mm-hmm. of running backs, the dolphins, a lot of these teams that met with a lot of running backs, there was, and, and I remember looking at the list and I remember saying, damn, man, like Ty Davis price is not on my radar, but like every team I'm going through, he's had a top 30 in. visit yeah. or he's had, he's been brought in for a private workout or what have you. And it was so many teams that I was like, and I didn't factor that, you know, every year we try to add something else, another layer to the onion and say, okay, well next year, I'm going to be a little bit better. or I'm going to learn from this. That's one of my learning points from this year in the draft. It's like, maybe we should have seen this coming with Ty Davis price in the sense of he tested better than a lot of people thought he would, mm-hmm. especially for a running back at his size. Um, he's coming out of an sec school and he had a shit ton of team visits. Right. So quietly before the NFL draft. Now maybe he like San Francisco was the only damn team that was going to take him in the top three rounds, sure. you know, like, Maybe that was the case. But the NFL but the other side of this like is, him. yeah, the NFL was quietly mm-hmm. saying, I, we got some interest in this right. guy, you know? And so it's just kind of putting together all these little yeah. tea leaves and saying, okay, maybe we should have been a little bit more in on this guy than any of us were. Right. So, you know, that's a good, that's kind of sort of where I was going is like we, we, we put a blanket statement out and, and it just really seems like, hey, I get it. We're playing the percentages of first second third round all that kind of stuff with draft capital and we're also saying hey the nfl's telling you that they like these guys but you know and you know awesome brad six seven thirty nine forty seven will tell you that you're an idiot because you don't know more than an nfl gm (laughs) and but you know meanwhile the eagles can't draft a wide receiver to save their lives the rams took two two at well Arthega Whiteside, you know, uh, Dwayne Eskridge, not that any of these guys are necessarily bust. They could, they could be just fine. Van Jefferson. Th- those are all second round picks. Um, yep. that, that Rondell NFL, Moore, Rondell Moore, you Terrace know, Marshall, Terrace Marshall. That's kind Ooh, of a, a second part hurts. of this that I wanted to get to. Um, you know, they get that shit wrong too. So, I mean, it, I think, I think you said it, it kind of comes down to me like, yeah, of course you're going to adjust Spiller, to the back you're going to adjust willis down a little bit 
But you're going to also use some confirmation bias of saying, hey, I still like Spiller, so I might take him over Ty Davis Price, even though the NFL is telling you, hey, we might like one team in the NFL is telling you we like this guy more or, you know, kind of any of those deals. So I just, you know, I, I it's definitely a tool that you got to use and, and you should use. And for a lot of the points that you pointed out, I completely agree with you. But I don't think it's necessarily the end all be all for for every single player because you know, like you said, like nobody nobody really moved Dwayne Eskridge up super high in their rankings because somebody took him in the second round. Nobody moved up Van Jefferson because somebody took him in the second round. And then, Mm -hmm. you know, like you said, Rondell Moore, Terrace Marshall, kind of how long does this draft capital last? Now, those were probably fringe first, end of second round guys, but nobody gives a shit about them now because they got the capital, but still nobody cares. Like, Bateman kind of put got put in a bad spot, and now all of a sudden has block like got got gifted. Hopefully, what should be an awesome spot, but it wasn't that fun. It took a land, uh, you know, a, a big change that nobody really thought was coming to happen. So, you know, it just seems like the capital matters until it doesn't, and then it also is used, you know, kind of when you want to and when you don't want to. So I, I feel like it is, you know, can be tricky to navigate and just. Not, I just hate that it gets used as such a blanket statement for for everything. Like, oh, you know, nobody gives a shit yeah. about Velas Jones right now. We're in an industry mock. I mean, I think we took him at like four three. Bears are telling yep. you they liked him in the third round. Like, I, I'm not going to take him much earlier than that. But nobody gives a shit about that guy. But they took him in the third round. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, you weigh, and that's kind of like where you come into the marriage of not only are you weighing the team situation and contracts and things like that, you're weighing the profiles in these guys. Mm. You know, it's not just that Vilas Jones is already father time. Right. It's also the fact that, like, he didn't do anything until he was old as shit in right. college. Fair. You know, so it's like. Well, when you're like 24, 25 years old, you should be whooping up on sure. freaking 18, 19 year old kids like, you know, OK, well, that's fine. But when you get into a situation where everybody runs a four four, are you going to be able to do that same kind of stuff? You yeah. know, so it's not like you're talking about it's you don't just weigh the capital. There's so many other parts or pieces and you see the guys that fall or the guys that we're not in on. A lot of it comes down to, OK, well, why are people not in on him because he went into the second or the third round? It'll come back to what does the profile look like? Yeah. You know, were they an early declare? Were they an early breakout guy? Are they strong in certain metrics? You know, and did they that's look where good you on see. Film? Yeah, that's where you see a lot of this stuff where it's like, OK, he went in the second round, but we might not give a shit because right. everything else about everything else besides that draft pick looks terrible so Mm -hmm. it's like say you got your checklist of four or five things and it's like well he checks one boxes the other four he set on fire and he pissed on he threw away (laughs) you know like (laughs) then okay well i I don't care about him as you know a guy that went in the fourth round or the late fourth round who checks every single box yeah you know so you know it's it's checks and balances guys it's you're just you're weighing all these different factors together and saying all right, I'm going to weigh all these different factors, and still, I hope I get it right. Sure, sure. (laughs) 